So I think we'll start with intros. Uh, Martin, I don't, do you want to reintroduce yourself? No? Maybe? Very, very quickly. Martin McMillan, uh, founder of Pollen VC. We provide uh, AR financing to, uh, to app and game developers, help them grow through paid UA. Um, I'm Eric Kress. Uh, I um, am an independent consultant for investors, uh, primarily related to the publicly traded companies, uh, you know, EA, Activision, Take-Two, et cetera. And I do a lot of consulting on the side, but I had experience at EA for seven years, seven long years, and uh, Kabam for two years, so kind of where I learned about the mobile side of it. Great. Uh, Joe Warner from S SVB, so thank you all for coming. This is awesome that everyone showed up. I heard it's raining outside. Um, been at the bank for 14, 15 years, focused on our consumer internet uh, sector here. That's anything from the city down to San Jose. So gaming definitely falls under that. Uh, I'm so excited to be here. Awesome. And uh, I've been working on my own uh, freelancing in the gaming space for a very long time now through social games, if I remember those, uh, and mobile games. Um, so yeah, excited to talk about this topic because um, I think it's very close to user acquisition as well as product development. So I think, uh, you know, we'll start, with Martin, with you, a topic, uh, thinking about funding uh, and generically and the different options. So I think we're here in Silicon Valley. I think the default is looking, oh, I, you know, go raise money from, from venture investors. Um, we'll love to hear your comments around kind of funding for different areas of the business from a mobile app perspective and kind of when you should think about the different options and what those options are. Uh, sure, I'll take that. So <coughs> I, I guess we think of it as like different horses for different courses, right? So uh, wind the clock back a few years is very much like, you know, what we think of as like alphabet funding. You know, you raise a seed, you raise an A, you raise a B, et cetera. And then <coughs> I think the world has changed a little bit over the last few years in terms of the different gamut of options that are available. So at one, st one stage you see now, instead of just pure equity all the way along to exit, which was the kind of traditional path, there are, there are, there are different options that you can uh, raise different sorts of financing for different sorts of things, right? And I think uh, we always, when we're, when we're working in funding companies, we always kind of preach this idea of capital efficiency. So use the right form of capital for what you're actually trying to achieve with it. So if you're doing something that's completely at risk, sure, go and raise equity. If you, if you have a batshit crazy idea and you want to, you want to go and see if people want to build, you know, buy and build this game, whatever, you need to raise equity to do that. Bad shit, meaning <coughs> making a mobile game, basically. <laughs> uh, and, and at the other end of it, if you've got really good established cash flows and you know, uh, then you've got, you know, you've got a lot more options. So you could just go and raise equity or you're probably going to raise a combination of debt plus equity. Um, as well, and <clears throat> the, the the point of raising debt over equity is basically you suffer less less dilution as a founder, um, and then they're kind of like mid mid row in terms of just uh, like isolating. It's like think think down. Don't, don't just say we need to raise money, so let's go and talk to VC and raise some money. It's like we need to raise money for this, and then understanding what the risk profile of that is and what the reward profile is. So if you're raising money, <clears throat> if you're raising equity capital to you know, go and hire a new team and open an office and build a studio in Helsinki, then great. If you're just using money to, uh, to you know, increase your pace of user acquisition that's got a 60-day payout window with a high degree of certainty, maybe there's a better way of, of funding that with, uh, with a debt product um, as, opposed to, as opposed to equity. So really just in, at every stage of it, think about what am I raising money for? What's the, what's the risk and reward profile of that? And then what are the different options uh, along that, that spectrum? So Joe, I'm going to turn it to you next. So you guys obviously are coming in at usually specific times in the life cycle of the business. Can you talk about kind of where are you usually coming in and uh, what's the sort of profile of companies that you're working with? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, I mean, I think to piggyback off Martin's comment, there are just a ton of capital sources out there. Um, venture capital is one source, but that's not the only avenue, nor is it the, the capital source that's for everyone. I think there's a lot of expectations um, from VC firms, from the partners that you guys potentially add on uh, to your company that um, the clock starts ticking once they write the the check for you guys to, you know, they want an exit of three to five X of what they're putting in. Um, and that may not fully align with your long-term vision of how you want to build the company out. So I think the way we look at it is um, it's more of an art than a science, um, how we get comfortable lending from a, a debt standpoint, rough math, series A, series B equity, we're open to doing 25 to 30% of that equity with debt. Uh, venture debt's kind of the easiest, smoothest way from a run a runway extension of uh, kind of think of it as a blank check that you get to have. It's an insurance policy. It's there when you need it. It's X amount. 
Typically, it'll afford you a quarter or two of runway if you need it. And that could be for product launches. It could be for fundraising to the next round. Um, it's used at the discretion um, for yourself. If you don't use it, um, no harm, no foul. It just goes, goes away. Um, but typically, that's kind of the more common avenue. Uh, anytime there's assets that uh, we can leverage, um, I think we're open to uh, doing that. Um, the way we kind of think about it is matching uh, the purpose of your spend with debt. So sales and marketing spend, we're able to kind of finance that. So if you do raise equity, which is super expensive, if you're giving up 10, 20, 30% ownership of your company, that's, that's a lot. Um, why use equity dollars if you can find someone that maybe finance that runway for you, um, you know, at a much cheaper, lower cost of capital. So usually the profile of the companies that you're in sort of the life cycle is, you know, they've built a product that's in the market they're generating revenue. Is that kind of usually where you would come in with these different? Yeah, that's fair. Typically, there's traction. There's visibility. Um, you guys are on to something that's that's working. Um, we're definitely okay with cash burning companies. Um, that's kind of the mantra for a lot of our early stage lending. It's Series A, Series B, Series C. I mean, you know, a lot of public companies, as we see, are still burning a lot of money. So that doesn't get us, I think, uncomfortable. I think um, we like to be a kind of an advisor. We don't want to lend too much money so that if things um, take a little bit longer to uh, come together, if there's mac macroeconomic factors that just no one foresaw, you know, we don't want the debt to be a hindrance, um, especially when you go to fundraise for that Series B, Series C. Um, you know, you want growth investors looking at the debt saying, are we funding money that you already spent or are we really giving you fresh equity to go spend and, and grow the company? So it is a balancing act and, um, you know, we try to advise on the pros and cons of using debt. Awesome. So Eric, I'm going to turn to you next. So from the sort of VC perspective, which is obviously appealing to a lot of companies, what kind of insights would you share around, you know, what companies are looking for? I think there seems to be a sort of, we're moving up from the trough of interest um, <laughs> yeah. for, for VCs investing in, right. in game, people creating content, if it's games or maybe, you know, non-gaming apps. What are they looking for? What are they interested in? How are they evaluating opportunities? Yeah, I would say, I mean, there's a long history of venture capital for the video game space, and it kind of started with the PC space and the console space, and then we saw this brief window of the Facebook game space, and then we saw mobile, VR, and now we are in the Fortnite space, is what I would say, um, from what I've seen. Now, I'm, this is not my expertise, I'll just be honest, but I have been talking to most of the biggest venture capital funds over the last year, kind of uh, working with a few of them, like Andreessen and stuff, and and all of their strategies are somewhat unique and different or kind of a spin on things. But ultimately, I think what a lot of them are looking for, um, first off, is uh, a strategy of trying to take advantage of something that's not in the marketplace that you can build upon. It's not a single product, but it's an actual <coughs> host of products that can be built from the original product. So building an engine that can be replicated across different uh, either platforms or different uh, games, you know, a series of games that would be unique in the marketplace. That's one big theme. The other big themes are kind of all the buzzwords that you hear these, these days, um, but, and I hate to perpetrate it in some ways, but, you know, cloud-based stuff, cloud-based tech that is unique, that, that, you know, things like that what Roblox is doing, you know, where um, all their stuff is running in the cloud and, and it's all being fed to all their users across, around the world on every platform. Cross-platform is obviously the other buzzword that is, is running around. Now, cross-platform means a lot of different things to a lot of different people, but ultimately the ability for players to play wherever they are, right? And, 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 you, and experience the content in a unique way based upon what the platform uh, provides. Um, social is a big, huge thing. I think if you don't have social in your game, you're not gonna be able to get that much interest on anybody at the VC community. Um, and then the free-to-play stuff that we, that we see the, all the success with Fortnite and, and PUBG and uh, Apex to a lesser degree, but um, you know, understanding the free-to-play model and how that will work and how that will translate to console and PC the way th th the games have been successful on, uh, on mobile. So I don't know, those are kind of the major themes that we're looking, oh, and then user-generated content, that's the other one. So Roblox, um, uh, Minecraft, those type of things, that, that's also very big. I mean, if you look at the guy at Roblox, like he's a genius, right? And he, is, he wants to build you know, the Ready Player One metaverse, right? I mean, the guy's out of his mind, but he's actually doing it you know, as we speak. And, 
and those are the type of big ideas that um, that I think they're getting interested in. And and Andreessen in particular is getting super aggressive, right? So there's money coming back, right? And it's been a long time, right? We haven't really seen the VR stuff was just a, such a flash in the pan. That was the kind of the last like funding uh, thing, and AR is kind of in that what realm too. By the way, just for the record. Uh, Pokemon Go is not AR. Can we just, just, just all agree on that one? So <laughs> AR is in its fledgling state right now. Um, I, I wouldn't go there. But, um, but anyway, so that, that, that's the kind of thing. When you think about what, what Roblox is doing, Minecraft, and, and, um, and some of these other you know, more platform style uh, gaming companies, I think that's what's really attractive. Awesome. Um, so we talked about, uh, you know, I'm turning back to Martin here. So, you know, different sort of uh, <coughs> funding needs for different sort of parts of your business. So you have building the actual experience, the game, whatever is the app. And then obviously the marketing side, scaling. So, you know, I think we've touched on a little bit this idea of like venture money for UA equals bad idea. You know, can you go into a little bit more detail about why that is um, and kind of comment more detail what, you know, what other avenues sh people should pursue? But, you know, because I've seen game studios raise money for specifically for this purpose. And maybe a lot of the op options didn't exist then. But talk us through like why is that you know usually not a great so, idea? So yeah, I mean, look, so some of this journey came from me as a <clears throat> me as a founder of a, a actually a music app company with this exact problem, and <clears throat> you know talk to VCs about it. Say, oh, you don't want to fund marketing spend, or you know some actually do because they are effectively getting an equi equity return for a, a debt risk. Um, <clears throat> essentially, it comes down to one, it, like everything in life, comes down to something very very simple. It's just really being on top of the metrics of of acquisition, but also the time. So people will often talk about, you know, CAC and LTV. <clears throat> now there's rightly so a much greater focus on ROAS, right? Return on your ad spend. But if you just take take one step back from away from all of the different kind of jargon, UA is basically one thing. It's an investment equation. How much invested in, how much invested out, uh, or how much returned after how many days, or if you're in social casino, how many years or whatever, right? So. And it, the, the time frame is really important, and also the degree of certainty. So if I can figure out that I've got a, I've effectively got a money printing machine. Every time I'm putting a dollar into Facebook ads or Google ads, I'm returning a dollar fifty after ninety days, and I'm actually breaking even after twenty days. <coughs> um, you just just sit down and, and take anything away from a, a game or an app. That's just you know, if you were to go into any kind of investment manager or hedge fund manager, or whatever, and say, hey, these are my numbers. I'm making a fifty percent return every ninety days. This is insane. The, the the question then becomes, okay, so do you have a money printing machine, and is it replicable? So if you're in a if you're in a like a really niche market, what you're gonna have what you're gonna have is like, you know, great. I think I've got a machine, but what's gonna happen is I spend a thousand bucks a day. And I acquire a thousand users, but by the time I spend two thousand bucks a day, I'm only acquiring fifteen hundred users. So my my demand curve is like super steep on that. Or if you're in hyper casual, you've got this enormous addressable market, and you can just spend for every cent or two cents, whatever, you've got an extra couple of tens of millions of people, whatever that you can go after. So understanding first of all the shape of that demand curve and how many people you can acquire at what different levels is super important. <clears throat> and then so really it comes down to if I can invest a dollar, I can get more than a dollar in a number of days with a high degree of certainty, right? So this is like if you can do that at you know, 80, 90, 90 something percent certainty, depending on how good you are, then you're taking a lot of the risk out of the equation. So why go to a VC, the same guy who's going to fund your crazy idea, to then say, I've got this dead cert proposition and you know, with a 90 degree, 90 odd percent confidence interval, I'm going to return this in this many days. Why would you use the same sort of capital for that? So then you can approach approach debt providers that understand and know how to price are on top of the numbers, can model the data and say, yeah, you guys are good at what you're doing, and we can pro put progressively larger amounts of capital in, provided this this equation keeps returning. Um, that's going to be a much better way. So we we obviously you know, we we kind of ask or get people to think about just the specific user acquisition spend is like isolate it away from the, the the rest of the business just look at the unit economics of it are those scalable um and basically it comes down to like i studied a million years ago i studied economics i'll never forget my first economics lecture which is basically the demand economics a demand and supply curve and that's basically what ua is your demand curve is like how quickly do the, does the cost of acquisition scale as you start to put your foot on the grass, and your supply curve is basically, you know, what's the you know what's what's the uh, the gradient of that, um, 
uh, as I keep continuing, will people still continue to spend the same amount of money or will it tail off the more people I buy? And really what you're trying to do is you, you get down to one thing, which is cost and revenue and you know, economic theory says if your if your marginal revenue is exceeding your marginal cost, keep doing it as much as you can until basically all all the profit has gone away. And it's it, it's really just down to that. It's like how much in, how much out over a period of time. Look at it as an isolated use case. And once you've figured out how, if you've got the machine, figure out how you're going to fund it. <clears throat> and nine times out of ten, you're probably better to fund that through debt if you can prove to an investor that you're really on top of the numbers rather than going back to your same equity investors. The good thing is that your equity investors should be totally supportive of that because they don't want to be funding it um, and, and in, you know, decreasing their fund returns. You're getting the same return for more and more money in is bad for them. So it's better for founders as well. Awesome. So Joe, I'm going to come back to you. So you know, we talked about evaluating uh, opportunities here. Um, and, and risk profile. So when you're talking to, I don't know, say a mobile app, a uh, mobile gaming company, I mean, you talked about the art and the science the sort of evaluation, like what are the sort of main areas of focus within those in terms of like maybe the art is like the product, the science is, you know, what kind of quantitative measures are you looking at and what's the sort of soft stuff that you're evaluating? Yeah, um, a lot of the variables are kind of really the experience here, like what's your guys' background, how many times have you done this, is there a track record that we can kind of get behind you know, being an entrepreneur can be really hard and lonely. Um, and so understanding kind of the ebbs and flows, the ups and downs, um, you know, we want to be able to kind of get behind someone that's done it before. That kind of just over the long trends, you know, where we've gotten into trouble is kind of the first time entrepreneur um, who he or she is in over their head, doesn't know what's going on, and is trying to solve everything um, alone. Um, doesn't mean that we don't do that, but that gets harder and harder. Um, typically, if you are raising money, who are those investors? More importantly, who are the partners at those firms that are on the board? Um, and then, you know, what what is the dollar amount? Quite quite frankly, um, like I mentioned, we're kind of for Series A, Series B, um, as it relates to kind of that growth capital runway. It's kind of that 25% debt debt to equity ratio, and that's just a jumping off point. Um, as it relates to kind of the core metrics within the business, um, you know, we understand there's again ebbs and flows, especially early on. Um, I think the retention numbers are super important, um, acknowledging that the equity dollars are uh, really expensive, um, making sure you're, those are being put to use um, as best as can be. Um, you know, the average revenue per daily active user, um, just a good barometer for um, companies that either have a free product um, as well as one that's looking to generate revenue. Um, it's a good barometer for us to see how uh, trends are going. Uh, it's a good barometer to see if we're the company's testing new initiatives, new marketing channels, you can kind of see any ebb or flow there. Um, outside of that, um, you know, we do want to um, provide guidance on there is a point in time where that debt becomes due. And so, you know, from a debt service standpoint, uh, which is when the principal and interest is, is uh, beginning to amortize over. Um, and these loans typically work like a home mortgage, typically over a 30, 36 month um, period. Um, you know, the debt service really shouldn't be more than 15, 20% of the total operating expenses of the business. Um, if things are going well, uh, the company's crushing it. Um, that's kind of moot because most investors will be lining up to give money. It's when things kind of hiccup, slow down, um, and then that becomes a larger dollar amount. That just becomes a bigger headache of you're spending something you um, already used to grow, um, and that didn't work. So now you still have to kind of repay this over time for an initiative that didn't help get you what you wanted. Um, and that then becomes the burden that I kind of mentioned earlier. Um, and we just try to avoid those situations or at least provide guidance on um, that could be um, the con to taking debt. And so it is trying to find the right dollar amount based on what initiatives um, I think are trying to be achieved. What about business models? Obviously, we historically were focused a lot on in-app purchase. Advertising has obviously become a huge revenue stream now with subscription. Do you kind of evaluate those differently these days um, or is something more, one of those more attractive to you I mean obviously there's a lot of stability with subscription um, yeah. but how do you guys kind of think about that business model yeah I mean companies that are working with um, Google Apple I mean that's great accounts receivable for us it's steady typically terms are probably what net 30 net 45 and that's pretty um, um, handy there in terms of something we get comfortable lending on um, I think where the value add is, there is a small working capital need at times, depending if those balances grow, where we can easily unlock that um, for, for a lot of companies, and that gets to be um, kind of an easy thing, which is typically our bread and butter. We can customize that depending on the dollar amount. You know, if you have intra-quarter, intra-monthly swings, 
um, those lines of credit are definitely super helpful. Um, and again, uh, you only get charged if you use it. It's really just there as kind of that insurance policy if and when there is that ebb or flow. Um, it, you know, it, it really does come down to, you know, what is the debt amount um, coupled with, you know, where is the scale and traction and what are companies trying to achieve? You know, I think for companies that are really trying to, you know, I think crush top line and that comes with typically a high burn, um, you hate to see then that become a no, a no man's land where you're too far away from the cash flow break, break even standpoint, which some investors like to see, um, and you're not getting the super aggressive top line growth that's going to attract investors. Um, so it really comes down to what's the strategy and what's the intent of the company. Is it to kind of be a fortnight? Is it try to get the market recognition? Or is it, hey, we found a niche. We know who our core users are. We're really doubling down and listening to what they want, what they see. We're iterating. Um, and we're not putting a ton of money in. We're reinvesting the net income into the business. And we're just going to be a slow and steady company that has a good market appeal. And people organically are going to come to, I think, this, the company or the, the app. Um, you know, I think the test for us is kind of that product market fit. If you guys turn off sales and marketing spend, are people still going to come to the game? And, you know, a lot of companies think they can organically turn that off and people are still going to play. And that really is a true test if people are going to kind of do it. So for us, that's kind of the, the test. Awesome. Um, so Eric, I'm going to come back to you here. So, you know, thinking about the sort of journey of a, of a business here, obviously you, people raising capital are usually looking for some type of, of exit a lot of time. Can you... I know you're going to talk about this in more detail after this, but would love to kind of, from the perspective of, um, you know, setting your company up for success for, uh, you know, M&A opportunities, you know, what kind of advice and, and insights would you share from that perspective, from what you've seen in the market and the people that you're talking to? Um, for, from an exit perspective, like getting acquired, um, you know, the, the bigger ac acquisitions that we've seen, we're going to talk about this in the next one with Zynga, um, Graham Games, um, Small Giant. Uh, I mean, they just built, you know, money-making machines, you know, these, these games. And they actually fit that profile of games that can be replicated under different genres, sorry, different, yeah, different, sorry, not different genres, but different themes, um, and, and potentially stack on top of each other, which is basically what Zynga hopes happens anyway. Um, so, and they are ultimately scalable. And of course, the um, profitability is, is critical these days. Like, so there's no market for, companies out there that are not in some way driving profit from their games um, that that uh, that has changed over time but um, you know Zynga is looking for those type of companies in particular I think but again let's talk to the expert in a minute what else is there um, I try to I am more about a high, maybe coming from Kabam I'm a little biased but I, I, I think the high LTV games are much, much more interesting to the market than low LTV games and high downloads um, I think those are, are far more valuable to companies because they they feel that they can scale them um, you know the hyper casual stuff and I'm I, so I apologize if anybody does a lot of hyper casual stuff but uh, <laughs> I think that's a race to zero right I, I don't really feel that that's where the market is likely going to be heading in anytime soon and that's certainly I don't think it's very interesting to um, um, so high LTV usually means like long life cycle games that can be operated for years right. essentially is yeah. more attractive and more core yeah oriented capturing that audience that spends lots of money yeah. okay great